أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم فلما أتاها when Moses arrived to it when Moses arrived to the place that he felt the fire was when in fact he arrived to it he saw that it was divinely lit light it was a light that did not consume that burning bush فلما أتاها نودية يا موسى when he came to it to that spot he was called out summoned he was ordered to move forward ya musa and the name of moses was spoken by allah and this is a powerful moment in the history of all those who believe that it is a direct communication from allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to one of his created beings bighayri hijab without a veil to veil the voice and the instruction the kalam of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to the Prophet Musa alayhi salam. Musa's senses are overwhelmed. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks directly to the heart of Musa in the capacity that is known to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as befits his majesty. We are not permitted to say Allah spoke in this way. Did Allah speak? Yes. Now some of the deviant sects that emerged in Islam, they would try to pervert this. They would even go to an extent to try to pervert the reading of the Quran that establishes the kalam of Allah to Musa. For example, Allah says, وَكَلَّمْ اللَّهُ مُوسَى تَكْلِيمَ That Allah spoke to Moses. And if you change that dhamma and make it fatha, وَكَلَّمْ اللَّهَ مُوسَى تَكْلِيمَ That if you change the recitation, it's implying that Moses is the one who spoke to God. And they said that Moses is the one who spoke to Allah. He called out to God instead of Allah is the one who initiated the speech to Musa alayhi salam. All of that because they reject the fact that Allah can speak. When Allah says in other places in the Quran, وَلَمَّا جَاءَ مُوسَى لِمِيقَاتِنَا وَكَلَّمَهُ رَبُّهُ the decisive word is where we find it in another place in the Quran. When Moses came on the appointed time and he stood in the right place, when he arrived in that place and his Lord spoke to him. You can't change the recitation. You can't change the fatha and dhamma. You can't make any perversion to it. And therefore the aqeed of Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah is that Allah speaks how he wills, when he wills, in the way he wills, in the capacity that he wills without tashbih, without a similitude, without us understanding how, or without us trying to delve and question the ability of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَكَلَّمَ Allah Musa taklima And Moses, he received an instruction from Allah. He was spoken to by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that is clear from the Quran. نُودِيَ ya Musa. He was called out O oh Moses. And this is a powerful moment. It shows us that Allah is connected to us subhanahu wa ta'ala. And as the conversation continues, you see that Musa is overwhelmed. He doesn't know who is speaking to him. Because you have to think that Musa is not aware that this communication can arrive from the divine to him. Musa is thinking this might be someone that knows me. It's someone around in this mountain somewhere. Someone called out, Ya Musa, Moses. An important benefit is that nowhere in the Quran does Allah command the Prophet ﷺ by simply using his name. When we return from our break, inshallah, we will continue to hear what was the first command that Allah gave to Musa salam. I hope you join me again. In the name of Allah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome back. We're continuing with our discussion with Musa alayhi salam. He's standing on the mountain of Turi Sayna. He's arrived in the place at an appointed time. There was nothing that can change it. They were lost on purpose. They were in need on purpose. He saw that fire on purpose. And he's arrived to hear himself summoned. Ya Musa. Meaning, come forward, O Moses. I know who you are. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Inni ana rabbu. I am your Lord. Remove and take off your shoes. For you are in the sacred spot of Tuwa. Allahu Akbar. 
The first instruction that is given to Musa is that Allah identifies himself. And this is always the first step of Tawheed. And therefore, whenever Allah is going to introduce himself to humanity, it always begins with this ma'rifah, an acquaintance, an ilm. It must be built on surety of knowledge that increases into yaqeen. Inni ana. Both words really are the same. I am, it is me, Allah, your Lord. And Allah repeats his identification twice. Inni, it is me, ana. I am, Rabbu, your Lord. It's not inni Rabbuk, I am your Lord. And this is an ada called tawkid, meaning it's an exaggerated emphasis to show you the importance of Allah wanting to be known. It's Allah saying to you and I as human beings, you need to know me. You know who I am, but I want you to know who I truly am in your life. Inni ana. It's not just inni, or it's not just ana rabbuk, I am your Lord. It is inni ana, I am the only one who can be your Lord. The only one who deserves that attention and devotion and sacrifice and worship that will come from you, Ya Musa. Remove your shoes. Because you are in a sacred land, called Tuwa. Now the scholars, they talk about this word Tuwa, what does it mean? Some of the Imams of Tafsir, they say Tuwa is a proper name, that this particular spot, its name is Tuwa. Others, they say no, the word Tuwa actually means blessed. Muqaddasi, Tuwa, doubly blessed. Tuwa means two times the blessing. It is blessed because it is the place Allah chose to speak to Musa, and it is blessed because Musa will return to it again and be given the commandments of Allah. So it will be blessed twice. Others, they said, it is the blessed buqah. It is the blessed sacred spot that increases in its blessing. Meaning every time its blessing increases as this dialogue between Allah and Musa, the blessing is going to increase from the beginning onwards until the end of the discussion. The word Tawah is also quite significant. You know, it means doubly, two times. There's a hadith of the Prophet ﷺ where he describes Musa. And the Prophet ﷺ described him, the hadith is an authentic hadith in Sahih Muslim. The Prophet ﷺ says that Musa was a giant of a man. Rajulun Tawal, not Tawil. He wasn't a tall man. Tawil means tall. But Tawal means double tall. So if you look up, you say, man, that person's tall. But if you look up higher, you say that person is tuwal, two times tall. That was Musa alayhi salam. He was a massive man. He was dark skinned. He was dark skinned. And he was a person who exuded confidence in himself. And he spoke with a lisp. He spoke with an imperfection in his word. He would slur his words just a little bit. He had a kana mahbus al lisan. His tongue was a little bit withheld, tied back. So we see that Musa alayhi salam, he was a blessing, and the place that he's arrived to was a blessed place. Why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala instruct Musa to remove his shoes? Some commentators said that the shoes were made out of a flesh that wasn't halal to be eaten, or the skin wasn't, you know, it was an impurity or had impurities on it. But it seems to be that the truth is that Allah wanted Musa to absorb the blessing of that spot. And it's almost as if Allah is saying, don't just listen to me, but let your whole body be in contact with this place. Let your feet be on the ground. Let your face be prostrate. For Musa alayhi salam, he fell down in sujood in that place, in that locality. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he continues in the next verse, وَأَنَ اخْتَرْتُمْ I am only me, your Lord. Take off your shoes, you're in a blessed place. Absorb everything in this place and everything in this moment. You are chosen by me, O Musa. It's not a coincidence. It couldn't have been any other man that walked out of the desert at that moment and received this blessing. You are here for a reason. It's not so absorb with all of your senses. It's not just sama' with your ears. 
Fastamir means let your body and your soul and your skin and your hair, let everything around you take in what you are experiencing now, Ya Musa, Lima Yuha, what is being revealed to you. Now that word wahi is a really, really significant word. And the word wahi in the Quran, wahi is not just revelation as you know, Jibreel bringing the wahi to the Prophet Sallallahu Allah uses certain words in the Quran. This is important for other lessons that you will have in the study of the Quran. Allah might use a particular word and it has different contexts and different meanings. Such as the word wahi. Allah says, and there's five or more meanings for the word wahi that's used in the Quran. One of them, of course, is that Allah communicates to a human being divine revelation. As we see here with Musa, as with Jibreel was sent to the Prophet Second, there is the wahi that is an instinct in human beings and even animals. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Nahl, وَأَوْحَى رَبُّكَ إِلَى النَّحْلِ Your Lord revealed an inspiration into the nature of bees. And اتَّخِذِي مِنَ الْجِبَالِ بُيُوتَ Where they are to build their homes, where are they to build their hives and so on. Number three, Allah uses the word wahi and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَأَوْحَيْنَا إِلَىٰ أُمِّ مُوسَىٰ أَنْ أَرْضِعِي We sent a revelation, an inspiration to the mother of Moses. It doesn't mean Jibreel came to her or she was given divine inspiration. It means that Allah gave her dreams. And another word of righteous dreams is that it's a form of wahi. And the Prophet ﷺ, he talks about dreams by saying that there are three types. There are dreams from the shaytan, لِيَحْزُنَ الَّذِينَ amanu. The devil tries to depress us and make us sorrowful and fearful. And those dreams are terrifying within us in our sleep at time. That's from the shaytan. The second kind of dream is hadithun nafs, is that your soul talks to you about some of the difficulties you're having in life. And some of the imams, when they talk about the tafsir of the dreams, they say if a person, for example, sees themselves drowning, it's usually because in their day-to-day -day life they feel overwhelmed. You have a lot of exams, you don't have enough money to pay your rent, you can't find a job, there's something that's keeping you down. You feel like you're drowning in life, in your day life, so you see yourself drowning in your sleep. The third kind of dream is a ru'ya, is a vision. It's like you are alive and see what will happen tomorrow. And those kind of dreams, they come with symbols and, you know, they have a science of tafsir behind them. That was one of the first elements of the reasons of the gathering of the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu If you open the book Al-Bukhari, there's a chapter called the chapters that relate to the dreams and the interpretation of dreams. So Moses' mother, she didn't receive revelation from Jibreel or something like that. She saw a dream of how to protect her son. Nine months before the pregnancy, she saw that there would be a change in Pharaoh's heart. He would put the kids to death. And she saw that she can save them by building a basket and putting them in it. And it will sail away. She saw that vision of what would happen. And that Musa would return to be a great prophet of Allah. Another kind of...